Thank you, and, and thank you to all of you for your great speeches today. I really enjoyed all of them. But if I could um, just pick on Andrew to start, because of um, you know, I think it's great that the PFS gets what's going on in Asia. I think it's really important. Uh, and, and moving to Hong Kong has been a, a big experience for me. Um, I was wondering if you could continue um, with what you were saying and also talk about the, the fluctuations in the Chinese market. Because um, Guido had mentioned a, a politically induced expansion of the money supply, which I think in China is just a case study in that. And the fact that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that 95% of that market is retail investors, which is very, very different to what it is in the West, where it's mostly institutional. Do you think that there are some really great opportunities, say, for Western asset management firms to get in there and, and perhaps act as a stabilizing force in the markets? Well, if, if they, they, we know that uh, the money supply expansion can't continue without consequence, uh, you know, the holy trinity of monetary policy, right? Um, you know the car is faulty, and you know the driver has been driving in a certain style for a long time. The question is what he or she does next. Um, if they choose to step out of the car, stop the money expansion, then uh, the currency exchange rate would hold, but there will be internal devaluation. You know, but if they continue the money supply uh, expansion, then uh, there's going to be capital flight. There's going to be increase in capital controls. And uh, at the end, either the exchange rate collapses or money just stops flowing out. So it depends on what their policy move is going to be. But they, you know that they're going to have to make a choice very soon. So I would make the analogy uh, of, um, if you ask me for a prediction, all I can say is that the car has a completely cracked windscreen. I'm not going to be arrogant enough to say that I know exactly what's going to be lying ahead. But because I know that my windscreen is completely cracked, I can take the safety precautions required for it. So yes. that would be my answer. I'm going to keep it on, Andrew, once more with thanks uh, for your earlier comments. And you mentioned energy security as one of their primary imperatives right now, and also the importance of the Malacca Strait and energy security as it moves through those particular territories. With what you've predicted earlier and mentioned to us, how does that square with ag increasing aggressiveness with China, further expansion into the South China Sea? Well, the, the, uh, the view from Hong Kong is that the, the mainstream view is that they are sort of expansionistic, they are national pride. But uh, I believe that it could be a count Keynesian counter-cyclical spending because uh, the early parts of reforms in China, Deng Xiaoping purposely starved and embarrassed the People's Liberation Army. Because if you take North Korea as an example, uh, if suddenly the Kim family was to open up North Korea, the final and probably strongest resistance would come from the army because they are the strongest vested interest. So um, they starved the army for quite a, quite a long time, maybe even over a decade, until the late 1980s, and then the um, defense spending went up. But uh, I, I don't know. I mean, you take the Soviet case, you know, with all their submarines. You don't, want, you don't want anyone to completely control your trade channels. And that is what the Chinese Communists are always thinking about. But they know that they can't really challenge the American hegemony either. So I think it's going to be the, you know, having control of the South China Sea would then threaten Japan. It's, it's a really delicate counter game going on, I think, in, in the region. Uh, but they were trying to gain more energy from Russia. Uh, the, the, I, I used to be an uh, oil, oil company analyst, uh, analyst. I studied all the Chinese oil companies as a profession. And the question that I boggled my mind was, you had the biggest energy exporter, well, uh, producer, next to the second largest energy importer of the world. I mean, they share a land border, Russia and China. And yet there was no direct oil pipelines going through those two countries. And it's only now... Uh, you know, nearly eight years after I stopped being an oil company analyst, that I found out the corruption was so endemic in China that uh, the official in charge of the oil industry could extract more bribes if there were smaller deals all around the world instead of one mega deal with Russia. You know, so that, that, is, that, is, the, that is the dynamics going on in China right now, which is, which is uh, I mean, we have government officials at the highest rank who would self-enrich going back to the, you know, doing harm to the nation or doing harm to the greater good, but for the self-enrichment. So uh, it, is, it is a very delicate situation in China right now. So. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you all for, for the speeches. Um, there is always a lot of uh, demonizing of the bankers or, or the commercial banking system when we talk about uh, central banks and, and the inflation. And uh, maybe I should be a little bit worried about my safety because I have a banking background myself. So please don't leave me behind at the beach today. But uh, I'm, I, have a, I have two questions uh, mostly uh, uh, and to, to the whole panel. I'm curious about the case of uh, uh, European Central Bank. Is it also uh, like a product of uh, evil bankers like the Fed, as Rothbard uh, showed us pretty successfully by following the money? Or is it something altogether, uh, like for example, a uh, political tool or just a tool f uh, to achieve some political aims, so like uh, the EU project in general? And my second question would be that uh, is the idea of uh, honest banking uh, lost forever or under this kind of fiat monetary system that we have? Or is it possible for uh, some entrepreneurs to uh, start competing with current uh, banking system to uh, just to balance it out or just to, just to have a, an honest uh, banking system? Okay, I'll start first. Well, to answer this latter question first, I think, of course, it's always possible. It's difficult to imagine right now, but that's precisely what entrepreneurs should do, right? Come up with a solution that nobody right now can imagine. And certainly, such an entrepreneur would face very strong headwind because the bets are against him. But on the other hand, we have a fragile situation. Traditional banks are not faring well, so it might be a very propitious time for innovation. Um, and then as far as uh, the, well, the nature of the uh, euro system is concerned, well, I think one would have to state that uh, there are in fact very different traditions of looking at the monetary system. Right? In countries like France, but also Britain, uh, the, the monetary system, banking, was always conceived to, uh, to be a prolonged arm of the state was really never different. The, the British have been more successful in making everybody forget this than the French, because the French are always more blatant and they insist. Right? So, uh, but in other countries like Germany and also Italy, uh, let's say Italy before World, uh, before World War II, uh, the monetary system had a different uh, role because um, centralization occurred much later, political centralization occurred much later than in the other countries. So for German, the monetary s uh, system was supposed to be an arbiter, a neutral arbiter between the uh, different banks and different sectors of the economy. So therefore, Germans have a great difficulty as accepting this vision of the central bank as an instrument of pro-government policies that now comes from, from, from other countries. So we're having great difficulties getting accustomed to this. May I perhaps? Uh, I do have my own. OK. Um, I don't want to go back to the analysis of why they created the European monetary system. But if, you, if your question addresses the issue of what is the political, say, goal, or what is the political manipulation behind the European Central Bank, the answer is straightforward. Uh, the overall design is to centralize more power in Brussels. And at the moment, more power means um, bring to Brussels the responsibility of fiscal policy, which means taxation and expenditure. Uh, one way of forcing the member countries to transfer sovereignty in these two areas, taxation and expenditure, to Brussels is to say, you want to be bailed out? Well, the price to pay is give me part of your fiscal sovereignty. So the political link between Frankfurt and Brussels is this one. Uh, Brussels says, you want the money? Give me your sovereignty. And this is going to happen sooner or later. The reason why it hasn't happened so far is that people would resent. Well, there are two things. Um, the European authorities screwed it up. I mean, they are so incompetent and so clumsy that they fail to obtain legitimacy. So people would resent this transfer of sovereignty. And the other thing is that taxation is so high that uh, a European tax on top of the local taxes would be resented. So they are they're waiting for the right moment. But sooner or later, uh, the deal will come through. I mean, we give you new, newly printed euros, 
you give us sovereignty. This is the link. The other question, about, which was about your money in, in the banks and whether there is an opportunity for, say, honest banking. Well, the opportunity for honest banking is the same as the opportunity for honest people. Competition would be the solution. If you have bad bank in a competitive com context, it would be marketed out. Uh, by consumers. So the point is that this is not a competitive market. The uh, bar banking industry is highly regulated. Entry is highly regulated. If you want to go out and say, now I start the Colombato Bank, you can't do it. You have to go to Frankfurt or to Rome or to Istanbul. In the, well, I don't know about Istanbul, but if you're in the European Union, you have to go first to Rome and then to Frankfurt, ask for permission, permission denied, and we're back to square one. So you have an incentive to misbehave. So if you have your money in a bank, but watch out because one day they will tell you, oh, I'm sorry, the time of bailout is over. Now we have moving, we're moving forward, which means bail-in. Your 100,000 euro deposit is still guaranteed. That's what they're going to tell you. But it doesn't mean they're going to give you 100,000 euros. I mean, what's, happen, what's going to happen once you have a bank run in Europe is that everybody's guaranteed. And they will tell you, come back domani. Uh, if you want to cash your money. And if it's not the money, it's going to be dopo the money. So <laughs> you have a claim to that guarantee, but you don't have the cash. So they're really um, fooling you in a way. So keep your liquidity low, keep it in your mattress, um, keep it in the garden, but don't keep, it, don't keep too much of it in the bank and run fast when the wind blows. Maybe I should add another line of explanation. Maybe, maybe, maybe first, the Bitcoin might be an example where people are trying to set up a monetary system uh, where the government has no influence. Um, we, we have to see whether that will be successful, but this is, I think, uh, a practical example of, of an alternative uh, monetary system. And the, uh, the second uh, issue which is on our mind is, I would say, the existence of national fiat money monopolies does not represent a so-called stable equilibrium. Uh, governments start cooperating with, with each other, trying to replace, the, uh, trying to reduce the competition of currencies. I think in Europe that has been successful, national so to speak, national currencies have been replaced by single currency. So there's no longer any currency competition in Europe. And I think that will continue, or efforts will continue, to install such a reduction of the competition of currencies on, uh, on an international global level. Uh, on the question of uh, honest bankers and honest banking system, uh, we have a in Hong Kong uh, a f half a million Hong Kong dollars, which is about um, 80,000 euros uh, deposit guarantee. And I spoke to the uh, to the uh, one of the people over at the government. And I said, "He obviously has failed in instilling this health into the banking system." They were like, "Why?" And I said, "People who have cash more than that amount." Do they split up their deposits in different banks? If only they actually go out there and take a $2 million deposit and deposit into four banks at half a million each, do you have a healthy banking system? If the depositor have no fear and they keep it in all one bank, knowing that they'll be bailed out or have a, have a rational expectation that they will, then bankers will be will, will, will misbehave. Um, I don't know if it would be bad, as bad as the uh, the case both in China and I guess in I heard in Italy as well, whereby you have a certain amount of bank account, but they said you can only take up that much cash. There's an upper limit. Uh, it's happening already. So, as I always say, only if the depositors are fearful, no regulators, no bankers, no uh, shareholders can ever make a banking system honest. If only there are banking failures, would the banking system be healthy? So. 
Um, first, um, four excellent presentations working uh, today, and I have a host of questions for everybody, but I'll just ration myself to two. Um, one is to Andrew. Um, <clears throat> over the last several years, China appears to have been trying to diversify its reserves uh, from almost exclusively dollars into other um, investments and, and, and also into gold. But there's a lot of mystery and, and, and secrecy around uh, what um, China is actually doing with gold. Do you have any indication of how much the gold reserves, uh, 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 how much are China's gold reserves, and um, what has been the pattern over the last few years, and to what extent China has been part of what seems to be a manipulation of the gold price? Uh, supposedly, a lot of these Chinese gold, or gold being purchased by Chinese government, goes through Hong Kong. And hence, uh, the dealers, the physical gold and silver dealers of Hong Kong should have a nice pulse. Uh, I simply, I mean, all the statistics coming out from China, I think, is dubious. The second least reliable set of statistics after the American ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we say in Hong Kong. So, uh, I mean, I call down to my dealer. If only, I mean, if only when uh, taken to the extreme, my dealer actually calls me because she knows how much physical silver or gold I have. She actually calls me and say, "We, I am willing to pay you, say, double or triple, whatever paper gold is paying you, because there is now a global shortage. Otherwise, it's all a guessing game." I mean, I think it's only until a few years ago. Chinese government gold holdings are actually a state secret in which anyone discussing it can be executed for treason. So uh, it's, it's all a big mystery. I mean, I rely on the price signals. Only if and when physical gold and physical silver prices start spiking in Hong Kong would I know that this highly ta well, fluid uh, asset which flows around the world finally have a shortage. I have no idea how much uh, gold China has. I mean, everyone here who, who has an account with an investment bank even if they tell you they have physical gold holdings, I and mean, this is from Morgan Stanley a few years ago, they cheated 16,000 gold depositors, saying that they, have, were, they were holding physical gold, charging them uh, vault rent, and at the end, it was just paper in the file. You know? So uh, it's, it's, an, it's a state secret. I have no idea. I'm still waiting for the price signals to, to happen and work. But uh, we, we shall see. We shall see. My second question, if I may permit it, is to Diana. Um, uh, the history of violence in American trade unions is quite well documented. I, I'm a huge fan of Morgan Reynolds and what he has written on, on, on the unions. Um, the, the, the impression I had as an outsider is that the powers of, of American unions over the last several years, uh, since the Reagan years, has declined considerably. And you even get articles by Krugman lamenting the fact that uh, uh, workers are now defenseless because collective bargaining has, has uh, has been emasculated. Um, the stories you told us about the culinary union, are they something specific to Las Vegas, or is there the pervasive strength of unions that there used to be in, in the States? Is, or is there a sort of a, a, a backlash against union uh, unions and this violence? Well, I think Reagan was devastating for the, the labor movement in the United States because he replaced all the air traffic controllers and sent a big message to organized labor saying, you know, this isn't going to work. You know, your walkout isn't going to work. We're going to replace you and, and we'll break your union. So there was a big decline. But I mean, since uh, the mem union membership has declined in the United States just steadily, you know, since its peak in probably the, the 50s and 60s. Um, but it's exceptionally strong in Las Vegas, as I said, because you can't offshore that hospitality industry. Um, but I think membership declining, uh, membership is declining, you know, steadily across the United States, but it's growing in the, in the public sector. So in the private sector, it's declining, but, but growing massively in the public sector. Uh, this afternoon has been really interesting uh, discussion. Um, I just wanted to kind of come back to a couple of questions that have been asked here and at the back um, and about entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurs addressing the, the issues with it that we're facing and honest banking and so on. There are really, really fascinating developments in this area. Uh, you mentioned Bitcoin, for example. There's a lot more than Bitcoin, the whole crypto finance space. Um, this is a space that I have a lot of um, uh, experience in. If there are people interested, I could give a presentation tomorrow during lunch 
just to cover some of the uh, main points on that. So just come to me afterwards and we could arrange something. Um, we all know that um, war is the health of the state. Um, endless wars on, on, on poverty and drugs and terrorism. And recently I've been um, seeing um, news items about the war on cash. I would like to hear your views on that, uh, especially Guido and, uh, and Torsten. Outlawing cash is a very convenient um, uh, intervention for the government and for the banking system in the current situation because uh, holding cash is one way to prevent that your uh, liquid wealth be simply be confiscated. If all wealth is that you hold in, in the form of money is on a bank account, then it's a simply, uh, simple accounting adjustment that can be uh, made by the banks uh, to just half or whatever, or diminished by, by to, to a tenth the amount of money that you have on your account. So it's a bail-in, right? So, so rather from, from becoming a debtor of the bank, you become only one-tenth of a debtor of the amount that you had before to the bank. If you hold cash, that's not possible. They would have to come to your house and take away the cash. And it's a very convoluted, very uh, unpleasant uh, process, right? And then, of course, it also becomes much easier to simply increase the money supply, right? Uh, by simply, uh, uh, again, accounting uh, adjustment. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we can in, uh, understand the motivation for the banks. It has the additional, uh, additional advantage that the demand for bank-created uh, money, rather because notes are not created by, by banks in most European countries, uh, but by the government, so by the euro system, uh, whereas uh, checking uh, accounts are created mostly by the, the, the banks or only as far as uh, retail customers are concerned only by the banking system so would uh, represent a huge increase of demand for their services so would prop up immediately the health of the banking system uh, so you can strike you can smash out several flies with one uh, coup so it's very interesting for them but of course politically and also economically a further path a uh, further step on the path to uh, devastation. Yeah, I may add, uh, this is the idea now that the so-called neutral interest rate would be zero or even negative, and once central banks push interest rates into negative territory, what happens is what Guido said, uh, you're losing your wealth, you're getting taxed, and the only way is to take your money out of the bank in the form of cash. Once they abolish cash, you cannot have this kind of exit no more. And in, on top of that, uh, this is, of course, uh, a measure allowing the government to track all your financial activities. They can know what you eat and where you travel to. And at the same time, at some stage, they can prohibit you to travel to Bodrum because your credit card doesn't work uh, at the airport, etc. So this is an outright attack, basically, on our freedom uh, because we have a monopolized monetary system where you're just just one provider for cash a, compet a competitor is not allowed as we just heard and so i would say this is a very dangerous uh, development it's a, a, but it's a logical consequence of uh, the continuation of this fiat money regime and i would say they they're working on it to get it done May I add just one little thing? Um, it's me. Uh, don't forget tax evasion. I mean, I think you're overestimating the uh, skills and farsight of our rulers. I don't think they really care much about money supply if you think of politicians in Rome, Madrid, or whatever. They look for the quick grab, and by forcing you to get out of cash and register all your operations through credit cards, checks, and whatever, they think that they can track you, your transactions and that tax evasion is going to be crushed. Don't forget, the tax evasion is luckily widespread. It is estimated to be about 15, 18% in Germany, 25 to 30% in Italy, the others are somewhere in between. So it's a big amount of money. And since they're thirsty for money, because they have budget holes everywhere, if they, can, if they think that they can eliminate even just one third of tax evasion by forcing us not to use cash, 
they're going to boost the tax revenues massively and kill the rest of the economy, but this is something that uh, does not come into their mind. So I would think that the prime reason why there is a war on cash is a war on tax evasion. I have a question for Andrew. Uh, you mentioned uh, interest in Austrian economics in, uh, in Hong Kong and China, and you mentioned interest from the leaders. Um, I, I find, what I found interesting myself uh, is that um, all the Austrian books are published, The Road to Serfdom, Socialism, and I know the control of media is very uh, strong, and everything is censored, and everything is watched. Uh, all of the um, very powerful books are all published in, in Chinese. Even Man, Economy, and State uh, just got published in Chinese. So what's your comment on it? I, I've, I had a feeling, too, that there were people in power that someone likes these books well, that's high up. I mean, uh, if you ask most libertarians, uh, their conversion, their road to Damascus started because they themselves were coerced into a involuntary position that turned out to be bad. Uh, and you've got to understand someone like Deng Xiaoping. He was thrown down, well, well, what's the term? He was demoted three times. I mean, he was like, you know, virtually the prime minister of China, right? And then he got demoted to become a factory manager. You know, I mean, factory manager was not glorious in a, co in a planned economy. You know, so he himself had tried, you know, three times this kind of treatment. And when you have a personal experience like that, you know, Mao was good in this way because he mistreated everyone poorly. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so all this literature was floating around. But uh, my, my, you know, um, my friend Peter, from, you know, also from the Lion Rock Institute, loves to say that a lot of Austrian school economics are naturally acceptable to people of China because you know, we had the first hyperinflation during the Mongols' rule, right, of the world. You know, they had the first fiat currency that was massively printed. And it was just natural. That it, was, it, it was just common sense, things that were passed down from generations to generations. But of course, not, it wasn't, you know, collected succinctly, like, you know, the, the, the writings of Mises and Rothbard. But um, we do have a natural inclination to these things. You know, um, we, I always love to tell people that the, the crown colony of Hong Kong in 1900, the single most freely, well, widely circulated currency was actually the Mexican peso, because it was a silver standard back then. You know, so we have a tradition. You look at banknotes in Hong Kong right now; it's still issued by private banks, nominally backed by the U.S. dollar. You know, so the government is actually nominally not in the currency issuing business in Hong Kong. But it is it's these kind of old stuff that the Chinese rulers of today, they have read all of them. I have full faith that they've read all of them and they believe in that stuff. And they know, according to Austrians, I mean, you know, according to the Keynesians, according to the monetarists, you move around the interest rates, you move around you know, aggregate demand, and you save other banks. But the Chinese rulers know that as long as you don't have competition, as you say, competition in the banking sector, you will have malinvestment that eventually leads to a banking crisis. And when that hole appears on the balance sheets of banks, you have to figure out a way to fill it. And that is where they get creative. So, but I, I, I do think that the Austrian school of economics will have more and more disciples. You know, uh, one of the most shocking things to Chinese people is that it took them, what, 10 years to accumulate $4 trillion in reserves. And it took the Federal Reserve a couple of presses of a keyboard to replicate the same amount on their balance sheet in the central bank. So, um, you know, to the Chinese people, that's like, it's time to learn about Austrian school economics. <laughs> I was very interested to uh, hear about the violence in the American trade unions because I think in South Africa often we think uh, it's only in South Africa that uh, some of our, um, as they would say, comrades in the trade union movement, because I work for a trade union, uh, but uh, in the more European style of unionism where we do not use violence. Uh, very interested to hear about this, but I'm actually more interested to hear about the, you could call it violence, uh, from the side of the court against private property in that ruling. Um, 
Why would you say the court made that ruling? Was it in alliance with uh, the unions or more with the central government? Um, well, in, in my view, it, it was a very political decision. Oh, in my view, it was a very political decision. I mean, I think that um, they strained. I think the court strained to come to the, the finding that they made. And I think they drew it out of thin air because they wanted the union to win. They have that much influence, even with the federal courts where the judges aren't elected in Nevada. They, they still have amazing influence. The thing that's baffling is why the Supreme Court wouldn't take that case. It's just really, that's the worst part of it. Because I expected the Ninth Circuit and the U.S. District Court in Nevada to rule in the union's favor, but I really had confidence that the Supreme Court would, would reckon the whole situation and they wouldn't even take the case. So that's the baffling part. Okay. Um, I have a question for the whole panel, actually, but my question was triggered by the presentation of Andrew, and I already talked to Andrew privately. Um, what I'm interested in is, is the geopolitical aspects of monetary policies. Uh, we don't know how much gold there is in China, but at least uh, the annual production is 406 tons, and you can also calculate what flows in through the commercial circuit. And if you do that, the researcher Kors Janssen from Holland has determined that there's about 9,000 tons at least in China, so according to non-official statistics. That's already more than the uh, purported 8,350 tons that would be in Fort Knox. Um, you, you, tend, you tend to um, describe politicians as, as stupid, not knowing, but maybe they just act like that. Maybe there's a, there's a, there's a higher um, plan to come to a, a, a bigger consolidation of debt. And I'm from Belgium, so we had the Belgian franc, and if the euro would not have come, uh, all the southern countries would already have failed. So uh, couldn't it be that, that the, the large amassment of debt globally is just a means to consolidate politically on an ever higher level? Uh, so I would like the panel, maybe each one of you, one minute or something to comment on that. Uh, on the question of gold, chi uh, Chinese gold mining, uh, honestly, no statistic. I mean, we would probably only know, first of all, if physical gold prices start spiking. Or second, uh, which leads to the great reset of money. I mean, when the great reset comes, then maybe every single government's going to wheel out their gold and show the world how much gold they have. But then, of course, we don't know if it's just lead with gold plating, right? <laughs> and we need a drill. You know? So that would be the first question. The second question about um, the uh, consolidation of global power. Okay, I, I always take pride in the fact that Edward Snowden, first port of call after leaving America was Hong Kong. You know, because we have a high degree of respect for privacy. Um, but uh, if you ask a Hong Kong banker, uh, you, want, you want to walk into a bank, you want to open a, uh, you know, you're a rich person, you want to have a trust fund, that's fine. We have financial services. They trace through your family, your children, your children's uh, spouses, and then your grandchildren. And then they discover that one of your grandchild was born in America automatically the bank could reject you from being a client. You know? So the reach of the American government is now even into the Hong Kong banking sector, you know, one that takes pride of being one of the original offshore banking centers of the world. Uh, you know, it, 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 there is now current legislation that the uh, Securities and Futures Commission in Hong Kong can share without the knowledge of the person investigated everything, the trading activity of this person in Hong Kong with quote unquote foreign jurisdiction. Uh, we are fighting it by saying that they're going to share with the mainland, but my guess, the pressure is coming from the American consulate. You know, so, I mean, it is, it is coming. We are talking about even if government nominally have sovereignty, you know, uh, they would still be subjected to the same political power coming, especially from Washington, D.C. Well, uh, if your question is about is there a global strategy behind general indebtedness? The short reply is you don't need a global strategy to be responsible. So you can be irresponsible, unaccountable, and engage in widespread profligacy, even if you don't cooperate with the others. 
the only thing you need is a creditor if you go into debt. Now, Europe found plenty of creditors in the past. Now they have a simple creditor, which is the European Central Bank. Uh, the Americans, they have found China. So, you know, and this is not a global strategy. You just need a creditor. And regrettably, uh, we found them. You know, during the conversations uh, at this conference, we, we talked already about the fiat money system. One characteristic of the fiat money system is that the debt load grows stronger over time than output increases. So sooner or later, you're running into a situation of over indebtedness. And that's the point where, you know, there's danger for this a house of credit cards to collapse. But central banks can step in, lower interest rates, and you know, provide any struggling bank or government with additional, new, uh, with additional money. And uh, that has been happening already um, without this, uh, uh, with this kind of interventionism, you know, I, I would say the fiat money system would have collapsed already. But it doesn't collapse, or it hasn't been collapsing so far, because the money, the, the demand for fiat money is holding up fairly well. People don't have lost their trust in holding fiat money. And it's very, very hard to unhinge this demand for fiat money. It takes a lot. And that may explain why, you know, the systems keep going. Can I, add, I want to add something about fiat money. Uh, one quick comment on fiat money. People always say fiat money is backed by nothing. Uh, from, from someone from Hong Kong's point of view, the American dollar is actually backed by the coercive force that can be generated by the American military. When, the, when Iraq got invaded, the, the logical conclusion was, well, then they'll be forced to produce oil, and therefore leading to a fall in oil prices which then, of course, is the increase in the, the purchasing power of the American dollar. You know, in the old age, when you can flee uh, a certain area under you know, the coercive force or whatever, nowadays you have drones flying over your head, right? And you can, they can be assassinated at any time. You know, so maybe fiat money has the ultimate backing now of coercive force instead of whatever we used like gold before. So maybe, you know, and I always say that gold and silver holds value throughout all cultures, throughout all ages of humankind, because it, um, well, the biggest use of gold and silver is jewelry. So it unleashes that primal urge, perhaps, to breed and uh, in men. So uh, therefore, it's, uh, therefore, it's so valuable over time. <laughs> the drones, right? But yeah, that's my, that's my comment on fiat money. That's why it's so hard to get rid of fiat money, because you'd be coerced into using it. You'd be taxed in fiat money. You know, that alone is 50% of GDP in France, right? So uh, that is why it's so hard to kick the addiction of fiat money, I think. Can, can I go back to the war on cash and Enrico's point about taxation and, and make a Las Vegas comment, which I'm sure Deanna will know. Um, obviously, there's a lot of anti-money laundering um, processes around casinos and reporting suspicious transactions. But perhaps what some people don't know is that the institution to which you support, you report those transactions is not the FBI, it's the IRS, which I think demonstrates exactly your point about taxation being the aim. And it seems to me that, that where there is global coordination around the G20 at least, it's, it's on this. It's on crushing any money which is outside the system and cannot be tracked. But, but my question for uh, Enrico in particular is that if the success of that kills the black economy across Europe, what happens to GDP growth, the real GDP, which is both outside the measurement system and inside, how, how negative would that be for true economic activity in Europe? Okay. Um, well, there is a statistical issue and there is a real issue, so to speak. The statistical issue is minor in that the black economy is already included in the official statistics. Uh, I know this sounds counterintuitive, but um, basically the idea was to say, well, uh, the official economy produces 100 euros of GDP. We know that there are, say, 25 euros in the underground economy. 
so we claim that the real, G the real GDP is 120, so to speak. Okay? But uh, we can't count it, but we know it's there, so we introduce it into the statistics. So this is the statistical, say, uh, uh, trick. The substantive story is that if they kill the black economy, especially in southern Europe, they're going to create millions of people unemployed because you cannot kill the black economy, have a regulated labor market, and uh, hopefully, and believe that everybody who was working in the underground economy will flock to the regulated official economy. So you're going to lose production because the production of the underground economy is not going to be replaced by the official economy. So we are going to lose a massive amount of wealth of, say, production capacity, and uh, this is, once again, irresponsible, because in order to get a few more pennies in tax revenues, which is debatable, because once you have a GDP drop, I mean, we know since Laffer, Dupuis, and all the others, that uh, you're going to lose both the tax revenues and GDP, and you're going to get a lot of social tensions because millions of people on the dole overnight, they're going to create trouble. So it will be suicidal. Uh, I think today's hot topic is currency wars and monetary policy. So my question is going to be a follow-up on that to Andrew and other economists in the panel. Torsten Polite has just escaped the question, but uh, the global investors and the financial system around these days are waiting for the Fed to announce something and Yellen, how she is going to talk next day, etc., etc. And are they going to raise the interest rates or keep it at the same level? Uh, when we look at the war between Chinese monetary policy and the U.S. monetary policy, China practically reversed the quantitative easing into quantitative, quantitative tightening uh, for the last couple of months. So uh, what do you think uh, about those uh, monetary poli uh, policy makers? Do they see what they are doing or they have no idea what's going on or they just take a random shot or uh, in the short term or in the medium term in, and in the long term? How do you see the, how do you foresee what's going to happen in the currency wars? I, I, I'm on Rico's side on this one. You know, do not overestimate the competence okay. of. Uh, uh, do not overestimate the competence of government officials. I mean, Ben Bernanke was the one that came out that says house prices are normal in 2006. You know, so. Uh, but then I used to work in an investment bank. You know, if you believe that central bankers are chosen by investment bankers to be placed into those positions, then the practice of say hiring if the bank wants the business of a certain company, was to hire an analyst that would be bullish, highly predictable in what they're going to be writing, and therefore place him in supposedly impartial an analyst post, and generating all these positive reviews of a certain company, and therefore the investment banking side can get the business. So, I, you know, the place, the Ben Bernanke was most famous for his 2002 speech about, you know, throwing money off a helicopter and yet he was appointed at the eve of the biggest housing bust in the US. So the people in power, if you subscribe to the conspiracy theory, knew that something was going to happen, and therefore might as well put the most dovish guy possible into that position. And when the situation came, they can start printing money. But as to currency wars, I, everyone wants to be the reserve currency. But the American dollar, the American, as I say, military, is so powerful, the reach, the power projection, you know, it, it's unrivaled. You know, I, I think of a, uh, a, well, rogue, say, Arab nation suddenly saying, I'm going to start accumulating more gold. I got a feeling that that particular Arab ruling family or whatever will be removed in no time. You know, the joke in Hong Kong is that not even six months after Saddam Hussein uh, uh, ordered all oil trades to be settled in the Euros, he got removed. You know, so I, it, you can get really conspiratorial on these things. 
But I would say that uh, you, know, you just observe whatever people use at the end at the point of purchase and to see who is winning the currency wars. So. I would say that the only strategy they have is to avoid the blame for what might happen in the future. So uh, you have to think of what they can be blamed for. If you look at the European Central Bank, Draghi does not want to be blamed for recession or for uh, bankruptcy, public debt bankruptcy. So he's going to keep interest rates low, not because he has a strategy about interest rates, but he has a strategy about his own reputation. And that leads him to keep quiet, flood the markets with liquidity. It's better to be blamed, in his view, for inflationary policies in, in the Austin sense than for recession or massive uh, bankruptcy across the board. Uh, in the US, it's different because the debt problem is not felt as much as in Europe. And perhaps uh, Janet Yellen is afraid of being blamed if there is a crash in the stock exchange. Uh, so that when you raise interest rate, people panic, uh, the Dow goes down to 12,000, and they blame her. So she, she's very cautious. Uh, but I think that the only, they don't have a monetary strategy. They have a strategy about their, say, alleged reputation. I'm online. I don't like the word currency wars, okay? I mean, the only weapon that central banks have is the printing press. The printing press is always you shoot yourself into the leg. When you use a printing press, the value of your own currency diminishes. What kind of war is this? This is a Monty Python style of war. Right? <laughs> okay, so. Of course, in the short run, right, they, they, there might be a conflict of interest between different currency areas because they all want to attract as much money as possible into their own financial markets. But the long run interest is harmonious. Right? It's, it's the perverse logic of a fractional reserve fiat money system. They can expend most if they expend all together in unison. Therefore, their real interest, long run interest, is in stabilizing exchange rates. Now, they cannot always do this because sometimes you have a crisis situation, sometimes there are troubles on the real economy side and so on. But as far as the pure financial issues are concerned, they all want to expand together. Right? So we shouldn't underestimate this. There might be some short-run conflicts uh, of interest, but these are uh, temporary. I have a question for Andrew. Andrew, how is the private gold holding in China? Because in Turkey it is very widespread because we have a long history, like you were mentioning, of uh, that you simply don't trust the money. So also very poor people have a lot of gold. And uh, my brother was joking, when a distant relative dies uh, in Anatolia, immediately every relative has to go. And the, and the guy who comes first because all his money is kept under the mattress, and uh, whoever is first gets the mattress money, you know. So, <laughs> so in Turkey, it is the way that nobody trusts the government, and uh, especially also the money. I mean, it's... it's uh... I, I honestly have no idea how much gold there are in private hands in, 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 in China. Uh, I, I suspect that during the uh, first uh, era of communist rule, a lot of it was shipped out. You know, the, one of the last things that the uh, previous regime, the nationalist government did before they retreated to Taiwan, was to force everyone to hand in their gold in, 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 in a return for some worthless paper that was hyperinflated at the end. So I really have no idea. I mean, I, I, I asked the same question about India. You know, if there was going to be a great reset in currency, Perhaps India would be emerging as the superpower of the of the of the next currency reset. Sorry. 
people keep a lot of gold in India as well. Um, yes, yeah. and, and so therefore we don't know how much gold there are, but also, I mean, if you want to have a functioning credit system, I, I understand this gentleman was talking about Bitcoin. You know, I'm still waiting for the emergence of the first Bitcoin bank, whereby loans can be taken on Bitcoin, deposits can be, you know, done in Bitcoin. So you have to have that function as well for the capital allocation process. So. I don't know. I mean, the, 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 the short answer is I have no idea how much. I hope there is a lot. <laughs> you know, maybe there is some private, you know, mining going on in China, like all other things. You know, so well, I don't know. Uh, but uh, hopefully there are sufficient w amount when the Great Reset comes, and it will come. So. world not to know how much really private gold there is in any country. Um, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, my, my grandma um, in communist China, my dad told me she still had a bag of gold that uh, she fed her 10 children with for maybe five years. When that ran out, she started uh, exchanging corduroys or silk. And that's what women did. They saved fabric as uh, alternative reserve assets. And when that ran out, um, they just went to their cousins in the countryside, started begging for reserve food. And uh, luckily, they live right next to a, a cabbage market that they all survived. Um, but um, I think it's a good thing that nobody really knows how much real assets people have.